Hello and welcome to the Gaggle Bob Challenge. And if this is our Destroy Media Narratives, I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And we have a special guest today, uh, which it was uh, uh, the author of a great blog, Syriana, uh, Kevork Almasian, who's an outstanding uh, political analyst. Um, his uh, perspectives on geopolitics and particularly on events in the Middle East are a, a, a must read. Um, so, Kivok, I have mean, a, lot, a lot to uh, discuss. Um, you have been um, commenting um, over the past few days about ISIS, the ISIS connection to the uh, Crocus City um, attack, and you are obviously somewhat skeptical about the official story, as we have been here on the gaggle, how everyone has settled on the story that it was ISIS, only ISIS, no one else was involved. Uh, America, apparently, out of the goodness of its heart, had given Russia fair warning. Russia didn't take this warning seriously. And this is where we are. So just, you know, fill us in. What 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 do you think? What do we know? What don't we know? You know, how, how do you see what's... Uh, what, what really and before you answer, I don't, I'm sure you both noticed that uh, responsible statecraft just took it hook, line, and sinker. No, no questioning whatsoever. I was just... I guess we're just gotten used to it, but I, they were supposed to be the robust dem diplomacy. Robust. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much really for having me and I'm humbled uh, for the kind words. Actually, I have seen so many comments on social media platforms by the talking heads, uh, especially in different capitals around the world. And these tweets are one sentence. It's either Russia did it, it's an inside job, or it's ISIS did it. We don't need an investigation and we don't need to dig in into this uh, complex situation. And to be honest with you, I haven't commented on this case for 24 hours because I wanted to see the footage over and over again and check how they were operating and their escape plan and everything. And I posted 50 minutes expose on my channel explaining how and why foreign intelligence agencies uh, weaponized and also recruited these foreign jihadists all around the world in the past. And this is not a phenomenon that it started in the 21st century. It started back 100 years back from now, and this was a brilliant idea by the Brits, actually. I'm using the terminologies of Hillary Clinton now. A brilliant idea by the Brits in uh, the mid-20s uh, to support the spawn of what they call political Islam. And this was in Egypt. Why? Because back then when they occupied Egypt and this was, uh, they faced the resistance. Uh, this was a social resistance and also military resistance against them. So what is the best way to control the people is divide and conquer strategy. So what they actually did back then, they started to support these Islamists in Egypt so that the Muslim Brotherhood organization has been spawned in Egypt so that the socialists and the nationalists start fighting against the Islamists in a state of this nationalist and socialist fight against the Brits. And similarly, they did the same thing in the 50s against Jamal Abdel Nasser, when Jamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, and then the Brits and the Israelis bombed uh, Egypt, and inside of Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, these Islamist groups, they moved against Jamal Abdel Nasser. In 73, when uh, the war erupted between Syria, Egypt, and uh, against the Israel to liberate the territories they lost in 67 war, uh, Back then, the president of uh, Egypt, Anwar Sadat, said, in the middle of the war, I stop now, I will, I will do negotiations. And the Syrian side said, I'm not going to negotiations. And the Americans um, tried to persuade Hafez al-Assad to strike a deal with Israel. And Hafez al-Assad said no. So in 19, uh, 1978, when Egypt actually signed the David, uh, Camp David Accords and Syria refused, what has happened in Syria is that the Americans, through their proxies in the region, supported again the Muslim Brotherhood, and there was a military insurgency against Assad to remove him from power through similar terroristic means. It's not a coincidence that this has happened in the past 100 years many, many times in the first Chechen war, in the second Chechen war, in Afghanistan, in Libya, and in Syria. 
and we have so many and, documents. And in Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina. Exactly. As well, yeah. I mean, uh, Ayman al Zawahiri was leading the phenomena in Bosnia. Osama bin Laden was reportedly in the uh, in the camps, in the training camps in Bosnia. Those are not coincidences. They weaponized these terrorist groups against the enemies of the United States. And I'm not here to claim that the fighters in these terrorist groups know about this uh, fact. They are just useful geopolitical idiots. However, on the top of the hierarchy of these groups, of course, the leadership uh, has um, connections and ties with the CIA and MI6 through the middleman. And this is the exact point we have to focus today. Who is the middleman today in ISIS who hired these uh, few individuals and the radicalized individuals, and they sent them to Russia in order to do this heinous terrorist act? I do not believe that ISIS independently acted and 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 uh, committed such a heinous crime in in Russia. I know for sure, for example, that in Syria uh, and in Iraq, the United States has a dirty dirty business there, and they have dealt with ISIS through the middleman, and the middlemen were Qatar and Saudi Arabia. So after 2018, when ISIS started to crumble, after 2015, when ISIS started to crumble, many of the leadership of ISIS fled the country. And some of the Al-Qaeda leaders fled the country. For example, Shishani, uh, Abu Muhammad Shishani, who was in Idlib, and because of the political differences between him and Jolani, he fled the country because Jolani was stronger than him. And he is reportedly now in Ukraine. And he, if he is in Ukraine, and he received uh, also reportedly uh, a Ukrainian citizenship, these people are a hub in or to to attract these international so-called jihadists, radicalize them, and also send them into missions. Some of them they don't even know actually uh, that uh, they are part of ISIS. They just know that they are in you know, what is called the holy war. And they are going to fight for what is called martyrdom. Therefore, when you see all these facts, even if it's ISIS, even if we're going to accuse ISIS behind it, we have to understand the intelligence connections behind it. Well, I mean, if I can interrupt just for our viewers here. So what you're saying is here, um, making the claim ISIS did it on a certain level. Well, that's true. They were the practitioners, but they was not. they're not the... Uh, puppeteers of it all. So that's why you can get so many um, uh, thinkers um, and government officials saying ISIS did it because on a certain level, yeah, it's like the hammer did it. Well, yeah, the hammer <laughs> did it, but we're not going to talk about who was holding the hammer. Exactly. I, I think in this case, um, the Ukrainian side has an invested interest in uh, committing uh, this type of attacks in Russia. And I would like to explain this because people are asking again, why would Ukraine commit such a terrorist act or recruit these people to commit such a terrorist act inside of Russia? And I'm not saying they are definitely behind it. I'm just saying, why do they have an invested interest in this? And they say if they can do this, then they, they probably should attack against military installations. However, why uh, such attacks are important during such times for Ukraine? Because when you commit such a terrorist attack, you disturb the social stability in the country and you, you uh, find or you spread the climate of fear among the people so that the people fear to go to supermarket, fear to go to the uh, music concerts and fear to go to theaters and to, uh, these are all part of the psychological warfare. And if the Russians are afraid to go and continue their daily lives, then the enemy is playing in the, uh, in the minds and the hearts of the, of, of the Russian people, right? So of course, Ukrainians have an investment interest and they have committed such terrorist attacks in the past for example the few assassination attempts uh, which were successful inside of russia including car bombs for example we have the what is called this uh, the the list that they publish names and they urge the, yeah, the people yeah. to act upon it and this is not something new by the way this is uh, um this is a very similar that what happened in Syria in 2011 and 2012. Everyone who stood with the government, there was a website publishing their names and their pictures, and many, many of them were murdered uh, on on this list. So similar strategy has been adopted also well, in this. You, can case. I ask you a question here, just as kind of a clarification? Is it possible, given what you know, that um, there could be an ISIS or ISIS-like cell? Uh, in Ukraine without the direct knowledge of the people in charge in Ukraine? 
Actually, it depends on the middleman here. So uh, if the middleman here is the uh, Ukrainian intelligence, because what we know for now, it's not a coincidence that the American embassy issued the statement with an information on the 7th of March saying that uh, the Americans should avoid gatherings, including concerts, right? And on the same day, one of these terrorists were photo was photographed in the Caucasus uh, Hall, right? So the American intelligence, they knew, and they said... The, uh, the uh, the the danger is imminent they didn't make speculations they said the danger is imminent so they knew something is being cooked up and let's remember what happened on the 20th of march those timelines are very important for us to understand what happened on the 7th the americans issued this alert security alert on the 20th uh, the national security advisor jake sullivan he was in in kiev warning uh, the Kiev authorities against bombing the or attacking the energy infrastructures of Russia, not because uh, they have a good heart, because they don't want for the prices of oil to spike just before the elections. They're just like shooting uh, Biden in the in the leg, right? But so the question here is, and this is a hypothetical question, has also uh, Jake Sullivan warned the Kiev authorities against uh, committing such an attack? If he was there to warn them against at at attacks against the Russian infrastructure, had he also said something similar about this terrorist attack? Were they aware and of it? One, sorry to interrupt. There's one other date that's an intriguing one. March the 5th, two days before that warning, Victoria Newland mysteriously resigns. No, no explanation. State Department doesn't explain. She doesn't explain. Resigns. Uh, yeah, the, the, woman, uh, the woman that said nasty surprises. Exactly, or, or twice. Maybe, she said twice. Mr. The Putin. nasty surprises, exactly. Nasty surprises, uh, really. It, it, what is nasty surprises? Uh, I mean, if there is on the battlefield, uh, any side can expect surprises, but the nasty surprise means something that you're not expecting it, right? And in this case, in this case, I cannot see anything but an asymmetrical warfare against Russia. And this type of warfare, to be honest with you, is aimed at to create divisions inside the Russian society among the Muslim people, the minorities, etc. And this was one of the main end goals of the American uh, grand strategy by wanting for Ukraine to become a NATO country. If Ukraine becomes a NATO country, then the four bridges of the Americans would be established. And that starts from France, Germany, Poland, and Ukraine. And through these four bridges, then the United States can project its hegemonic power inside of Russia and destabilize Russia like they did during the Chechen Wars to create these divisions among the different minorities and different uh, segments of the Russian society to disintegrate the Russian Federation. That's the end goal of the Americans. However, this terrorist attack, in my opinion, the Russian side dealt with it in a perfect way by also blaming the Ukrainian side completely. I mean, they have also to play with their people, right? They cannot come and say, oh, those were uh, oh, the Muslim people, for example, you know, they don't want to cause any sort of uh, sentiments, negative sentiments like the Americans did after 9-11, because they wanted to, to make the uh, Muslims as a boogeyman. But the Russians uh, dealt with this uh, perfectly, in my opinion, in order to keep the internal front united uh, against uh, one enemy and then blame the, the, the Ukrainians. And this attack, if the Ukrainians are behind it, it's a very foolish thing to do because they have given the Russians a perfect, perfect excuse now. And also, they, the Russians can extract any confessions now from these terrorists and 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 weaponize it and and well, uh, capitalize the, on the, it. I agree. This uh, divide and conquer ca causing uh, social dis uh, unrest in Russia. It hasn't happened at all. I was in the center of the city for hours today on uh, on the Met. For some reason, it was a huge traffic jam. I don't know what that was about. But the, the, the metro system is packed. Uh, stores and restaurants are packed. It's not having that. I would actually, I would say just the opposite. And George and I have been chronicling this for ever since the um, this phase of the conflict uh, has started, is that there's a lot of people here, which doesn't get any uh, any traction in Western media. There's a lot of people saying, why is Russia fighting with one hand tied behind its back? And that and, and now that's getting a lot more vocal. OK, is that, you know, why is Zelensky able to fly in and out of the country to go mm -hmm. to the Oscars and the Grammys? And all? why is he 
you know, when, when our children in the Donbass had to live in the basement for eight years and this clown gets to fly around the world, okay? Yeah. That sentiment is growing. But do you expect now the Russians to hit more the leadership in, in Ukraine? Oh, absolutely. That's a major, that's uh, a major absolutely. question. Well, yeah, it's but... very interesting because a day before, if I get my timing right, and yeah, and I don't think it's uh, connected, at least at this point, is that Piskov made it very, very clear that Russia is in a state of war. We haven't heard that rhetoric come mm -hmm. out, Well, which I personally, I welcome it. Young men are dying. Okay, this is a war. And because it is a war, it has to be won. Okay, not objectives. Are you subjective in this? No, win. And everybody knows what winning means. OK, the, the utter destruction of your opponent. OK. And so, you know, we, we we've um, uh, um, attacking the the energy infrastructure has been um, escalated, not just substations, which we talked about for what, George, over a year. OK, now they're going after the the uh, the, the core systems and. Uh, and, and 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 again, public opinion here, they voted for Putin, you know, at what, 87 percent said, let's finish the job. That's one yeah. of the things they voted for. But don't you think the Russians are a little bit careful? Like if if, oh, if they're, the too Russians, care they're too careful. Yes. Yes. If the Russians now uh, target Kiev, for example, and the leadership, this will also increase the talk here, increase the uh, conviction in Europe that they have to send uh, ground troops to Ukraine, right? And the ground troops in Ukraine, in my opinion, it will cause direct clash imminently. I mean, definitely. And the, I, the Russians I, are not I, going I to mean, spare. And I think just to follow up on Peter, if Russia doesn't do it, they will send the ground troops anyway. So I think it's there like, you go. <laughs> yeah, there you so go. The, the, the more Russia holds back, the more uh, NATO moves in and believes that Russia is just a paper tiger. So, you know, you, you know, if you if you want to avoid a direct NATO clash, I think you just go in and get the job done. What, what my what the people that um, know something about the military, it's hard to describe them. Like they're former military, former intel, uh, intelligence officials that I talk to. They, you know, when I you know, when they when people say I attack the leadership, they just they calm down, Peter, calm down, calm, just calm down. Kharkov, Odessa. That's what mm. we're thinking about. That's what we're thinking about. Okay, not Kiev right now. Mm. No, taking out the intelligence services. There was a major hit over the last forty-eight hours, I think, um, to send a signal that we know exactly where you are and we can do what we want. But again, you know, the this slow roll. That's what it seems to be doing. Um, public opinion here demands something more, and but not an overreaction. No carpet bombing of Kiev. Nobody is saying that here. Okay, but um, people need uh, 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 be, to be given a something tangible, a hope that this thing is is going well, and it's got to come to an end soon. I have to say there. We they, we people talk about. Uh, war uh, fatigue in Ukraine. There's fatigue here too, okay? I mean, yeah. people want this thing to come. Whatever the outcome is going to be, the, the West is never going to love us again. We accept that, okay? We want our young boys home. That's what people say. Peter, uh, you remind me of what's happening also in Syria. The Syrian army is from the same uh, military school of the Russian uh, army, right? And the the people always ask for decisive actions from uh, the government or from the army to crush, for example, what's happening in the deserts or crush what's happening in uh, in in Idlib. It's, and we don't really understand their calculations. And in the future, we see that all of a sudden, when the correct time comes. They put all their weight into this uh, war, and then their allies come and join, uh, for example, in this in this war, like the Russians and the Iranians and the Hezbollah. Truly, in my opinion, the Russians are trying to keep, even if like this is small enough window for negotiations in Ukraine, and they're trying to keep this uh, uh, any any hope for negotiations uh, for. It's uh, not going to happen. The, the, it, yeah. It's not going to happen. I'm not the, going. I'm the not, West isn't going to negotiate I'm, anything. That's up off the table. There isn't going to. There aren't going to be any negotiations. I I mean, so you have to just go in and take whatever you think your objectives are, and that, and that you know that's that's you know that's the, up to debate as to what Russia now sees as its crucial objectives. But they're not going to get any negotiations from the West. The West is against yes. Them. And, and I want to add to done. what George says there also is that even though I said there's an element of fatigue, yes, there is, but there's also this kind of normalization of the special military operation. That needs to change. Mm. That needs to change. And 
with, with the terrorist attack, uh, actually very close to where I live, actually, um, it, it's refocused everybody's attention. Is this this needs to be resolved? Okay, a mandate has been given. People went to the polls, and this is and people are saying we need this resolved. Okay, without you know they those crazy Russians, they're not crazy. They're they they're very. They're very calculating, actually, and I, none of us are military people, and and that's why my my friends around me they kind of pat me on the head. Peter, you don't understand how this works. Okay, well, so, like, I, I have to work, say, okay, I mean, the, the Syria issue is a particularly difficult one because Syria can't do very much because Idlib is being under the protection of Turkey. Turkey. Well, Syria can't go to war against Turkey, so there's really it, it's it has limited options, and again, you have the United States in Syria which is occupying large territory, allowing, of course, ISIS uh, within its territory. Again, Syria can't take on the United States. So, yes. so the Syria analogy isn't quite right because Sy Syrians themselves are really are, you know, small and vulnerable. And they don't, you know, they have to then essentially accept the fait accompli presented to them by uh, much greater powers. Exactly. Look, what is the priority of the Russians uh, today in Ukraine? It's the Black Sea, right? So they have to seal the Black Sea. Uh, they have to go to Odessa. This is uh, in, Odessa. In the this is this is the military strategy. If they seal uh, the, uh, the the waters in front of Ukraine, then Ukraine loses its uh, importance. And even if they want to become a NATO country in the future, and it's not going to happen, in my opinion, if the Russians occupy Odessa, Ukraine will be disintegrated. And there are other countries are eyeing, like Hungary, like Romania, and others eyeing. On some regions uh, in Ukraine, and so, we, we can't forget about Transnistria also with the Odessa gambit. Also, exactly, and and there were big, uh, uh, historically big battles over Crimea and over the Black Sea. So this is the particular focus that the Russians are put, uh, putting all their weight in. In when we when 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 we see all this situation and what's happening in Europe nowadays, I think Europe is in historical uh, mode at the moment and truly historical. Today I was reading an article from an Estonian website and they say Estonians are in favor of taking away voting rights in local elections from Russian citizens, only from the Russian citizens. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so we now replace the Russians with Jewish people. Just replace that with Jewish people. How horrible it is, right? But when you write uh, Russians, uh, it doesn't sound any. Uh, it doesn't sound horrible for in the ears of uh, many Europeans because they normalize this. The yes. Russophobia is a real thing, and I live here in uh, in Germany, and I understand. Uh, due to some, uh, of course, the indoctrination that they have and some grievances in the past or whatever they know about history. I think this war in Ukraine has shown to us a lot about the state of affairs in Ukraine and also the the many of the hidden facts about World War II that I wasn't aware of. And I started to dig in more and understand the role of Finland, the, the role of Sweden, the role of Estonia during World War II and the sieges on Russia. Yeah, well, so the, the, the Cold War gave every, <laughs> all of the most, some of the most vicious elements in and. Uh, odious characters, a nice clean bath. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice... If, if we just go back, you know, because there's still the the, the aspects of the crocus. Well, I, I I wanted just two two things real quick, George, because I I think I know what you're going to say. If the Baltic republics want to send their troops there, go right ahead. Fine. <laughs> okay. Number two. Number two. And I think I'm preempting George here, and I apologize. Can the Russians make a case? That 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 it um um deflates and destroys this ridiculous narrative. That uh, the, ISIS did it. Okay. Okay, ISIS did it. I mean, they can deconstruct this uh, narrative, of course, but uh, the the Russians are not known for uh, putting the information in public. Yeah. And they, they don't act upon it. The Russians know a lot about uh, the connections between the regional and international intelligence uh, apparatuses with these terrorist groups, but they don't play their cards openly. And they always, because uh, they also have ties with uh, these foreign intelligence agencies, right? Be in the Middle East or in, in Central Asia. So it's a very complicated game for, for the Russians. But however, in, in any case, they are going to link this to Ukraine. Whether it was uh, uh, 
ISIS, not ISIS, they're going to link this to Ukraine. And to be honest with you, increasing uh, evidence uh, surfacing, uh, especially uh, today I was reading for Pepe Escobar, uh, the SBU and the GUR, they are all involved in the uh, process of first importing the some of the heads of these jihadists into Ukraine and incorporating them into the uh, hiring process inside of Ukraine against the Russian forces, especially that we've seen some of the videos also surface from Ukraine of ISIS flags among the fighters against the uh, the, the Russian forces, right? So I think the 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 most important element here are three countries: the Turks, the Qataris, and the Saudis. The Saudis are not going to play this uh, game anymore in hiring and uh, recruiting these jihadists and sending them against uh, in in the past against the Soviet Union and now against against the Russia. The Saudis have their own now vision in the region, the economic vision, and they want to modernize their countries and they just want to get along now with Iran and with Syria and the rest of the country. They don't want to play this. Even Mohammed bin Salman said we were tasked in the past to spread Wahhabism. We don't want to do this anymore. And this was clear in the past. The Qataris are still playing this game. The Qataris are still involved with the jihadi groups in Syria, in Al-Nusra Front, with ISIS, with different elements in, 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 in Syria and in Iraq. So in my opinion, uh, the Qataris are the most dangerous uh, middleman still in hiring these jihadists around the world. The Turks have, I mean, not bad and not good relations with, uh, with the Russians, but they don't. Uh, Favo, uh, as we say in <laughs> with, <laughs> with the Russians anymore. So uh, the Qataris are uh, NATO's, uh, uh, or uh, the the Americans call them um, the most reliable ally of, outside of NATO, and they have the biggest military base there, and they recruit these jihadists in Syria up until well, this Well, it's no coincidence pay. the Qataris are the intermediaries for Hamas as well. Yeah, of course. And they pay and they pay. And a uh, few weeks ago, a group of jihadists attacked uh, from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, from Tataristan, and also from Bosnia against Syrian army position in Aleppo, in Western Aleppo. And all of them were killed. And because the Air Force came and everything, the, the reinforcement was very quick. And this, if we, if we read the American press, every person, uh, they receive $2,000 per month. Uh, these fighters to stay in Syria because they have a family and they have wives and they don't work. Their work is uh, fighting, right? So who is paying $2,000 per month per head for these jihadists in Syria? Who, which, which regional country has the financial means to pay $2,000 per head for thousands of jihadists in, in Idlib? Turkey doesn't have that. Saudis aren't doing that. The Emirates aren't doing that. Who is left? The Qataris. Right. So, and the Qataris now are also in bed with uh, everything is happening in the Gaza Strip, and they're playing double game. The Qataris are playing a very dangerous game in the region, and uh, with with the, the only party left in the region who is playing this uh, dirty game in recruiting and weaponizing the uh, the Islamists in the region is Qatar. It's not. It's not Iran. They try to blame Iran for standing behind Hamas, but it's not. The Qataris are the ones who sent all these millions to Hamas uh, be between 2007 till uh, 2023, right? They're the ones who are financing Hamas. And we've seen after 2011 when Hamas was on a crossroad and they had to choose between being with Qatar or staying in Syria, Damascus, and continue their struggle <laughs> against the Israelis, they have chosen uh, Qatar, and they went and they resettled in Qatar because that's the main source of the uh, financial but the, source. But the Americans know exactly. Do you think? you think it was the Qatar that was, um, you know, providing the funding for these uh, the the Tajiks? The Tajiks who said, "We, you know, we got five five thousand dollars. We got two two and a half thousand dollars up front." Do you think that's right. That's, nah, kind of that's a very small money. That's a very small money. Anyone can recruit this uh, this uh, low IQ people. It was very clear. I mean, I have never seen in my life an ISIS fighter who gets captured and is so terrified like that. And I have never seen uh, an ISIS fighter who gets captured and doesn't say that he was ISIS. I have never seen an ISIS so fighter who, trying. Okay, so who? Okay, then that leads to the next question. Who yeah, do you I think, don't think we've who, ever who, seen who, an who, ISIS who fighter. Who do you think they were? Who do you think they were? Then these people. 
I mean, it could be from anywhere. I, I think it could be also from Ukraine. That's not a big amount of money per head yeah. to pay uh, for one time. We, they're not paying it for multiple times and they're not paying it every month. In Ukraine, month. 2,500 bucks goes far, goes far. Right, exactly. But like, yeah, but but that's, but that's you know, who provided them the, the, this money, do you think? I mean, if the Americans are sending billions to, to Ukraine, then of course, some of it will go to these groups who the Americans, when you pay uh, billions of dollars to Ukrainian armed forces, right? And who is fighting under the flag of the Ukrainian armed forces incorporated inside the Ukrainian armed forces, some of the neo-Nazi groups, right? And they are receiving their salaries also from, from the United States. Therefore, you know, one th something that George and I, we did it on um, uh, on Monday, right, George? Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, when George and I do do our podcast, he, he never tells me in advance <laughs> what we're going to do. I always have to react, and we we get me do it well. But George, um, he did a really smart thing. Um, you did I don't know, did an hour Google search with yeah, Ukraine. Yeah, exactly. The, it, Go it, ahead, George. Take it yeah, away. No, the the um, the Ukraine Islamist connection, which has been going for some years, going all the way back to 2014, they were they were already Islamist had made their home in Ukraine and were yeah. fighting in the Donbass. According to Western media, okay? Exactly, this was Western media. You know, this was reported in Western media that there are Islamists, um, you know, some of them have come from, uh, you know, the Tatars, some were uh, from, uh, you know, from uh, Chechnya, some from the Middle East, but they were already in Ukraine from 2014 on. So, you know, that's, you know, therefore the, the, the story put out by the Western media, there is no Ukraine Islamist connection. You know, that's just wrong. Just going by Western media. We're not even talking about the Italian Russian foreign Western minister. Media. What did he say, George? If the if it was true, the Americans would walk away from Ukraine. Was yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like yeah, that. That's right. Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. Actually, wherever you see the Islamists, you see the Americans are in the same place. They played this game in Iraq in uh, after 2003 in order to crush the resistance against the Americans. They're the ones who they had this again brilliant idea of supporting the sectarian uh, genocidal maniacs. In, in Iraq in order to create a, a strife uh, between the people who want to really counter the American and British occupation or fighting among themselves on sectarian lines. And the Saudis were, again, back then uh, playing an instrumental role in supporting these Sunni sectarian groups in order to slaughter the Shias, and then the Shias had to react against them and cause a civil war. And this has happened in between 2004 and 2005. And remember what happened in 2005. In 2005, the, uh, there was the assassination of Rafiq al-Hariri and the former prime minister of Lebanon. And he was a very, very important Sunni figure in Lebanon and in the region. And this has added the fuel on fire in the region and led to the withdrawal of the Syrian forces from, uh, from, from Lebanon. So, and back then, an Islamist group claimed responsibility for assassinating Rafiq al-Hariri, and they were tied to Al-Qaeda again. But the Americans said, no, 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 those were not Al-Qaeda uh, who assassinated Rafiq al-Hariri. It was Syria, and it was, Al and it was uh, Hezbollah. And now, 15 to 18 years later, they don't even have an evidence for that, but they uh, brought the case to the UN Security Council and they uh, kicked the Syrian forces out of Lebanon and they removed this buffer zone between Syria and Israel. And now the fight has moved from Lebanon into inside Syria in 2011. So they always benefited from these terrorist attacks. They always capitalized on it and they always had ties with these uh, terrorist groups in everywhere. They wanted, if there is a statico and they want to break the statico and to reform, to reform a new uh, political realities, who are the ones who are willing to fight? And it's very easy because uh, the uh, the money is in the hands of the Gulf power, the Gulf countries in the region. And the, so just, uh, the, what's interesting is what you said you've never seen ISIS fighters like this. You know, ISIS. You know, the 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 actual people who could commit these atrocities, they're willing to you know sacrifice themselves. You know, because they will go to heaven mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But that and wasn't doing the case. It, doing, doing it, doing it, doing uh, Ramadan as well is very exactly. Yeah, yeah. But they, that's right. These people were very strange because um, they they did they did it for money, and as you say, they didn't say that we we're we're part of ISIS. Where everybody else, whenever they're caught, they say, "Yeah, yeah, I, I'm part of ISIS." Even yeah. you know, like the guy in the that gay club um, in 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 2016, you know, killed all those people in, inside that you know whatever whatever was in Florida that gay club. He said, "Yeah, I'm ISIS." So, but then these these people didn't say that. So that makes it very strange. So like, yeah, 
Well, George, it, this is the first people. time in, uh, uh, over a whole series of um, uh, uh, terrorist attacks when they find the culprits dead or alive. They haven't found the passport yet, have they? I mean, this, this is another weird thing about this. They oh, remarkably, they found a passport. You know? A passport. Yeah. There are there are two things to add on this particular case. One, uh, if we see the picture that Amar uh, platform published, and all of the faces were blurred. I mean, it's very strange first to blur the faces. Secondly, Amar doesn't do that, especially when the operation is already done. Secondly, when we see uh, uh, the Shahada index finger. All of them were raising the left hand, and the left hand is frowned upon in Islam because they say it's the hand that you clean the filth, right? You always use your right hand, and I wanted really. I went to my. Uh, I want to see the jihadists in in ISIS in Syria and Iraq between 2014 and 15, and I'm checking photo by photo, and you don't see even one finger, one picture. They raising the left hand, and then they reverse the photo. Uh, there was an Israeli side uh, debunking our claims that there's something strange. Why are they raising the left hand? And they reversed the photo, they mirrored it, and they said, no, that was uh, the reverse one. This is the original one. But unfortunately for them, they were standing uh, in front of a, the flag. And now the letters in Arabic is reversed. It's like, I mean, we can, uh, I, I can read and speak Arabic, right? So they cannot fool us in this. And secondly, uh, ISIS fighters, you are an ISIS fighter, right? And you want to commit such a big terrorist attack inside Moscow. And you have an exit strategy. At least you know that there is a big possibility that you're going to get captured. So where do you head to? Do you go to the Ukrainian borders, the, the most guarded border, <laughs> border now between Russia and Ukraine? And secondly, why don't you wear a suicide vest? Because you wanted, you say in the statement of Amak that you wanted to kill some infidel Christians, right there. So why not killing more infidel Christians in in the past when you're getting captured with a suicide vest and kill them? This is what they did many many times in Syria. This is the modus op operandi of, of of ISIS. And now they say this is not ISIS. This is ISIS K. It's like an ISIS light, you know. So they didn't want to, <laughs> to blow off themselves or something. Like there's so many questions that. They need to present concrete answers to it for me to be convinced well, Alistair, that also. Alistair Crook is of the mm. opinion that uh, ISIS K is it, it's just a, a basically uh, a, a go to when you need an ISIS organization. <laughs> I mean, he, he says it's not really a meaningful organization at all. It's much more of a Western construct. But, no. And here's someone that has you know forty years experience in the Middle East. Yeah, who is who is ISIS today? I mean, they don't have a structure anymore. They don't have a leadership anymore. They don't have uh, military uh, training camps. They don't have like really planning execution of, uh, of of plans. This phenomenon of ISIS in Syria is only a few pockets now in the deserts on the peripheries of the American occupation forces in alternative border crossing. And the Syrians aren't allowed to come anywhere close there because the Americans shoot against them if they come uh, against them. They just send them to like hordes, you know, to fight uh, something to commit uh, suicide attacks against the Syrian forces up until this moment. They do suicide attacks. So strangely, these ISIS fighters, they didn't want to commit suicide and uh, reach uh, their goal, which is martyrdom, right? Because this is the um, ha the highest, highest uh, and most noble goal of any ISIS fighter is to martyr, become a martyr and go to paradise and um, meet allegedly with the prophet and have his 72 virgins. And this is not a joke. I mean, I've seen videos after videos after videos of these uh, Chechens and the Saudis in Syria sending youth, Syrian youth, 18, 19 years old to commit uh, suicide attacks. And none of them is asking the question, why isn't he going to kill himself if there is the paradise and there are all these virgins? Why is he sending me to kill myself and not he going to kill himself, right? So uh, these people in the uh, higher positions in, in ISIS, in my opinion, structurally ISIS has been destroyed, but uh, there are some lone wolves now. So they, uh, of course, they took them with the helicopters from uh, Raqqa. God knows where did they send them, probably send them to Afghanistan. And from Afghanistan, the geography is too big and too complicated for any international intelligence to monitor clearly where are they going to, right? And probably they go to Central Asia, to Tajikistan, as you also 
mentioned and probably also to Ukraine. Ukraine can use these forces because these jihadists, so-called jihadists, they have an, um, they hate Russia with passion because the main force that uh, destroyed the backbone of the ISIS forces in Syria was Russia. Put away all this talk about the American campaign. Yeah, Donald Trump Canada. did it. Okay, fine. If you want Bye. to say it, it's fine. Okay, okay. Fine. it's okay. Yeah. I, all I care is the good. You, I want to. I, I still want to unpack something you said. Mm. I think it's very important. Um, we've already said that you know the uh, the uh, the Russian um, intelligence services, their investigative services, will have a very good idea or a very a, a very clear idea exactly what happened. However, the caveat that you present to us is that the Russians are. Uh, unwilling to uh, expose their methods and sources. Okay, we, we, MA, uh, MH17. We have the same problem with that. Okay, yeah. But do you think they can make a, a, enough of a public, plausible, convincing case that there was Ukrainian involvement? I mean, if there is a co communication and especially phone calls and um, and and chats, because these people were recruited on Telegram. And if they know the 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 person who hired them, and they can trace all the communication data, and they could publish that. And the there are different intelligence uh, apparatuses. Even in Syria, they do these things nowadays. And when they uh, capture a terrorist, they don't only show his confessions, but also show the data and the communication and also the phone calls of this person and the texts that he was exchanging with, with the middleman, the person who recruited them, and his ties with foreign intelligence, for example, in Qatar or Saudi Arabia. Now we don't have all this phenomena, but Syria did it in the past. So the Russians, of course, can do it. And especially Especially that the Russians are a very uh, uh, advanced in their cyber uh, intelligence nowadays, and I mean, look, I don't want to, I don't want to be harsh, but this was also, uh, in my opinion, them failing to detect in. This attack also it was also uh, a, a failure. It's a, it, it, it was it's, it was a failure. It was a failure. So now I think they will invest in this and uh, they will trace. And there are many allies willing to to cooperate with the, the Russian side and especially the Chinese. And there is talk, and I'm not sure if this is uh, hundred percent accurate. So don't quote me on this. That when this uh the german generals when they were speaking about sending the taurus missiles to ukraine and how they can hit the bridge in the Krim, etc etc there, there are rumors that say that the chinese were the first who detected that and because one of the generals was not well, they were in, in singapore weren't they? singapore or... yes because he was in singapore and the well, one, of, one of them i think was in singapore yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there were a number of them all over the place but one 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 guy was in singapore yeah, so uh, that was that was a Trojan horse, you know, that the uh, Chinese were definitely listening to that, and uh, they shared this. If if it's true, then they shared it with uh, with the uh, with the Russians, and then the Russians made it public. So there is a precedent now of when there is a concrete evidence of uh, a plot and conspiracy against Russia, they're publishing it, and by publishing that tape, what they made clear to the Germans and to the NATO countries that. If you supply Taurus missiles to Ukraine and the Taurus missiles hit our infrastructure, then this is a German attack on Russia and not a Ukrainian attack on Russia. This was the message behind publishing this uh, the, this uh, tape. And this led into big discussion here under the Bundestag. There's so many MPs now are pushing against sending the Taurus missile because also, the German media and some of the German press, they mentioned is that probably the Taurus missiles can carry tactical nuclear weapons. And if we send these Taurus missiles to Ukraine, then the Russians, if a Taurus missile is fired on Russia, the Russians do not know if there is a tactical nuclear uh, attached to it or not. And they could act accordingly, right? So this is a big, big risk. They are playing with fire. And I'm, I'm someone like... I'm accused of being pro-Russia, and I think that I'm just a normal person with sanity, and I just want for the Russians and the Europeans to live side by side peacefully. And I truly believe that the Russians and the Germans together, they can become a, a big powers on the global scene, and they could make the entire Eurasian region prosperous, well, advance it, together. With, with, with Victoria Nuland gone, maybe that's a remote possibility right now. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 
Europe is the biggest mystery to me in all of this. And maybe with the few minutes that we have left, what happened to Europe over the last two years? I mean, the complete abdication of sovereignty. Um, I I know German history, at least modern German history, pretty well. Um, I, I'm, I'm just uh, astounded on how the German mm. elites have just kind of abandoned their own national interests. So you're, you're there. Can you? What do you have to say to that? It's a big mystery, but if we want to give an answer to it, I would say that they have prepared for this for at least two decades now in different political parties, for example, in Germany, and I will name them the Greens, the well, Social I, Democrats. I, th I think the Greens, George and I have talked about, I think they're just a CIA cutout. Sorry. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 what other conclusion can you draw? How how can you explain that the Green Party up until this moment, they call Idlib, that everybody knows it's an Al-Qaeda safe haven. They call it the last bastion for democracy in Syria, right? And uh, they host, or they, I mean, the Greens, the Social Democrats and the CDU and the FDP, all these four uh, political parties, they have been infiltrated heavily by the NGOs and the people who were training these politicians to become in positions of power. They have worked on it for a decade or two to bring people like Annalena Baerbock and, uh, um, uh, the, for example, this Strack Zimmerman in the FDP. She's, uh, uh, she's a military lobbyist. They were purposely brought to these political parties and they were groomed in order to become in positions of power but these people are very incompetent and i truly i truly believe that they don't know the meaning behind the words when they say it in in public for example when annalena bebok says we have to give ukraine everything they need to defeat russia she doesn't understand that militarily when you say everything so you you completely uh, uh, removed all the limitations and for the Russians this like they don't know in Russia how to deal with this because they don't know if they mean it or they don't mean it you know what? <laughs> how to deal with yeah, such but you can't take any chance you, but just to echo your point you, ha you can't take any chances everything means yeah. everything <laughs> Yeah, everything means everything. So uh, in Russia, I think it's very difficult to uh, to deal with such a political systems uh, in established in in Europe, and in Germany, the media is in the hands of the uh, Americans. It's very pro-American. The political parties are very very pro-American. So everything is is in on the side of the United States in terms of indoctrinating the people, and also the political establishment. So you will see. Uh, uh, this policy, and that is anti-German policy, in my opinion. And this but policy, a, but it's a very interesting point because that's why we talk about the CIA. That there was a time. You just go back to the 1970s when, both in the United Kingdom and in Germany, you had powerful left-wing parties that were anti-American. They really would, yeah. didn't want to have anything to do. They thought the Americans were a disaster. They were leading their countries to war, and the the Americans, I think, very cleverly infiltrated these uh, parties, they created a fake kind of left party, which is, I think, the Greens. It was a fake party. It destroyed, essentially, the real left, which was on the German Social Democrat. And they did something similar in Britain. They kind of created a kind of the, a, a fake kind of leftish sort of party. They isolated the, uh, the Labour left. And you got Tony Blair, mm -hmm. uh, who was suddenly, hey, he's a Labour leader who was all gung-ho for uh, war. I mean, it was, I mean, it's been a kind of clever long-term operation and we can also add france and italy to the mix well france had a, you know once had a very powerful communist party obviously very anti-nato italy had a powerful communist party very anti-nato they've all gone well, well it, eliminated. and france had what we called even to this day gaullism yeah, Gaul, yeah. it was that like gaullism so you had gaullism on one hand and communism on the other neither, neither was pro-american in Germany, well, when the Greens started in the 80s, they, ha they have pictures and they say that uh, uh, Deutschland, uh, they, they want to bring Germany out of NATO. This was in the 80s. Yeah, in the and 80s. then the infiltration started of these political parties. And now George Soros receives prizes from the Green Party. <laughs> George Soros is an honorary in the SPD. And they have invested a lot to break the, the left in Germany. And who is left from the left? It was uh, It's the Linke Party. It's the left. However, they 
also divided the left party into two parts now. Yeah. And now Zara Wagenisch and her people, they formed their own party. They are like four or five percent of the uh, in, in the voting polls. The only political party in Germany that is uh, consistently against the NATO war in Ukraine is the uh, right wing party, the AFD. And that's a sad thing because for <laughs> because in Germany, there should be an anti-war left wing movement and that doesn't exist. So what the right party like Trump, what they do, they capitalize on it in the absence of these uh, anti-war movements. They capitalize on it and they gain all the votes. The people need to understand that so many people who voted for the left parties, they are voting for the right wing party and they're not neo-Nazis, they're not nationalists, they're not, they're not, they're just anti-war and they want for their economy to be functioning. And the AFD is presenting them that we will restore the Nord Stream pipelines. We want cheap gas. We want to reduce the taxes for for the people who have more babies, for example, in Germany, right? It's just logical things for the people. What, what, to, what are the prospects for success? <laughs> you know, because we've done a number of gaggle podcasts about the AFD, but we also think that if they were came close to power, they're the going to ban them. State would come banned. at them and and just ban them. What you what, want? What you want? Think? You want my conspiracy theory? Mm-hmm. My conspiracy theory is that they are uh, fighting against the AFT, and as much as they fight against the AFT, more people are voting for the AFT, and they want for the AFT to come to power so that they blame all the failures in the past two, three decades and put it on the AFT and say, when the right came to power, our economy collapsed well, and see it, the it, situation it, in Germany. <laughs> there's a historical parallel, you know, just as um, in November 1918, when Germany... <laughs> Well, uh, the the uh, the front was collapsing, you know. And they, you have the Kaiser and his folks. They give it to the social. It's all yours, <laughs> it's baby. Yours. Okay? And they inherit defeat. They inherit depression. <laughs> you know, yeah. In in dis, in in, in um, dis, uh, a society in complete disarray. I, I could see that happening. Yeah, you know, <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna pass the baton uh, to so um, uh, uh, the the alternative people can take the blame. Yeah. I have friends in the AFT. I told them this. Uh, I said, look, they want, there is someone who wants you to come to power in the next elections. And then when you come to elections, you will fail so miserably in your task that everything will be blamed on you. When the economic crash happens, they will say it was the fault of the AFT because the economic crash doesn't happen in a month or two. It's an accumulation of uh, failed policies, but the people will not understand all these different uh, complexities because the media will, the press will definitely blame just one side and they will simplify the discussion as they always do. One of our uh, favorite topics that German I, uh, I have is the Nord Stream 2. Um, I guess it's left to the Germans to come up with uh, a definitive uh, uh, conclusion of what happened because what the Swedes and the Danes, everybody's saying, well, it's not our jurisdiction. That's and, right. you know, they're, <laughs> we're not going to release what we are. We're going to give it to our partners. I mean, um, I, what is... I'm... I'm more, oh. I'm more, I'm more pro-German than many of these people in power. Like I want to know what happened because I'm the one who is paying ex, uh, uh, double the, the bills <laughs> 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 and, and everything. I want to know what happened in the the Nord Stream pipeline and my. Well, I mean, we know exactly. Uh, apparently, uh, Western intelligence knows exactly what happened in Moscow last Friday, but nobody knows who blew up the Nord Stream. Ironic, isn't it? Ironic, isn't it? I, I think they don't want to know. Uh, and they know it tacitly, and uh, there are so many parliamentary uh, statements by parliamentarians asking the government and urging the government to follow up on these investigations. But there is no uh, intention to follow it's, up it, on it's this. It's funny investigation. because the German media. You remember a few months ago they were running all these stories about Ukrainians um, on boats. You know, some hot babe who was you know part of it, and so on. That's been dropped. You know, no, no one is talking. Yeah, and they blame the guy that's already on trial for something else. Like, it, it's, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, at least right. in the Anglo sphere, we say blame the dead guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. The problem, the problem with this type of reporting is that uh, Germans are not full, you know. And the people, when they watch television, for example, and if they anyone who has a YouTube channel and just sees something alternative pops up in, in to his face, and listens to people like yourself, and then listens what in the media uh, in the media say on TV, he will feel that his intelligence is being um, like somebody insulted, insulting yes. him. You know, when they turn on the TV, every time I turn on TV here, I don't watch the uh, 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 only I turn it when there is a football, but 
I just want to see someone, what are they saying still, you know? And I feel like, oh my God, this is not news. You know, they're not giving the people news. They're just trying to uh, uh, hijack the brains of the people and uh, trying to minimize the level of the discussion in the country into very, very, very low level that the people cannot hold conversations among each other and cannot discuss about these important political cases. And this is uh, spreading desperation among the people and defeatism among the people, right? Because they feel they're powerless to change anything. And even if hundreds of thousands of people demonstrate against any policy here, nothing changes. Yeah, people have the right to demonstrate, but what comes after the demonstration, right? People are are 70 percent of the germans are against the german policy in the gaza strip what, what but is there any change isn't this the will of the german people to stop sending for example arms to uh, to israel but the, the german government doesn't listen and if i say anything as a, someone living now in germany criticize israel and they interpret it in a way that they consider it an anti-semitism then i will end up losing my everything they will take away my everything. They could take away my resident permit again. They could uh, take away my rights, everything. And there are there is a federal state here in Germany that you have to accept the right or sign on a paper that you recognize the right of Israel to exist if you want to get a German passport. And yesterday they changed the naturalization law uh, requires you to take a politic test. And now they in the politic test, they, there are questions. They just added it. New, new questions to it uh, about the Holocaust and uh, how important the, it is to accept the legitimacy, legitimacy of Israel and how important it is that as a, if you become a German citizen that you have to be pro-Israel, right? And this is like, what are they doing? You know, uh, it, it always this uh, raises the questions if they are purposely trying to create social instability here, because they have millions of people from Arabic countries, from Islamic countries here. And these people are not going to stay silent about no. these cases, right? Like if there is someone who is purposely provoking these people, and if there is an economic crash, Peter, in Germany, and God, God forbid, and if there is an economic crash in Germany, you have also newcomers in Germany, lots of migrants and refugees who are on uh, the job center, which is the social, they receive uh, the taxpayer money of the people who work in order to finance their affairs. But if the government cannot finance this, and then the government is completely pro-Israel, and these people cannot afford their uh, their basic food, you know, this is a recipe for social instability. What the government is doing is just beyond me. I don't understand what are they well, doing. Well, you know, as, as we wrap up here, I, I, I warn you to be very careful what you say about America, because it's possible you could be implicated in the January 6th riot. Okay, <laughs> be careful. Exactly. Be so, careful. So, so Kivok, thank you so much for giving us your time, for all your fascinating uh, insights. And um, so people should, if they want to hear more from you, they should go to Syriana. Uh, the, that's your yeah. website. Syriana Analysis on YouTube, actually. Yeah, it would be great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. And you're, you, and you're one of my, you're one of Crosstalk uh, fans' favorite guests. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon.